Well, initially I had no idea what I was doing or how to play the guitar. And I don't know why, but I thought that you were only allowed to do upstrokes. So for, for two years I was just... You know, only up. And finally I, I started taking lessons from a teacher who showed me that I could also do downstrokes. Or both, down and up simultaneously, or not simultaneously, but alternating. But I didn't really, initially I had no concept of how to pick fast. I just wanted to play, you know, your basic kind of rhythm guitar. And I think the first thing that approached the picking technique that I learned had to do with muting on the bridge. Um, I really liked the sound of Van Halen. He, that was out when early on. So I was learning things, you know. So for something like that, I wasn't even thinking about upstrokes or downstrokes. I was just thinking about tone and how to... How to get a big, huge staccato. You know, I didn't really even want to play fast yet. I just wanted it to go jug, 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 and that I got through muting. Um, for picking faster things, I had no confidence at all that I could do it for the longest time. I would see people, you know, my heroes picking fast, and I thought, well, that's why they're the heroes, and I'll never be able to do it, because it, whenever I would try, it would sound horrible. So really, I concentrated on left-hand things, where I wasn't picking very much, maybe one note per string. But my left hand became very strong and adept because of that. So when I finally started to learn some picking patterns, um, the left hand was already set. And the first lick that really got me over the bridge was this one, with three notes on a string and one note on the next string. In this case, it's B, C, D, and an E with an upstroke. So it's down, up, down, up, then down, up to get back to it. So. All alternate picking. If you've seen my instructional videos, you know, this is all over the place. So that was really the thing that got me into fast picking. But that was, you know, eight years after I started playing. It didn't happen quickly. And I don't think it should have happened quickly. I think the left hand really has to come first. The left hand steers, the right hand is the gas. And if you can't steer, you shouldn't press the gas. <laughs> Well, if you alternate pick a three note per string scale, you have no choice but to do both alternate, both outside and inside. They both occur, you just can't help it. You know, when you, when you start out changing a string, the first time you change, it's outside. You go between a down and up. But the second time, it's gonna be inside. So both of them occur. Um, I think for me what's important is I really like alternate picking um, in that each motion is separate. You know, I don't like to do two downs in a row in one motion. Um, it's a very efficient technique and some people do it very well, but it doesn't have the same rhythmic and dynamic control that you can get from alternate picking. So for, for scales, I really prefer alternate with all separate motions. And it's plenty fast for my purposes. Um, with other licks that have uh, more hammer-ons and pull-offs where I really have a choice. You know, I've, I've got time, because of the hammer-ons and pull-offs, I've got some time to decide what kind of pick, picking I want to do. For those, absolutely, I try to do outside picking. Um, I can use more force because of it. It's the same principle with the snare drum. The further away you get, the harder you can hit it. And to me, having the ability to hit it hard gives you more tone options. Um, it also really makes it a lot cleaner especially if you're doing string skipping licks. You know, something like this. Where I'm only using notes on the high E string, the G string, and the low A string. There's, there's strings in the middle that I'm not playing and I don't want to hit them by accident. So if I'm going outside of those strings, there's way less chance that I'm going to accidentally hit, the, hit this one, the B string, that I don't want to play. If I'm doing inside, then it's almost impossible not to hit it. So for those licks, you almost, I, I can't see how you do them unless you do them outside picking. And I want to be able to do those licks because I like them. You just do that a little slower? Yeah. So this is five notes. One, two, three, four, five. It's a B, 
my seventh fret, three notes on the G string. There are G, E, and D. Just picking the first one, doing two pull-offs after that. And then a G note on the tenth fret of the A string with a downstroke. So it's up, down, two pull-offs, and a downstroke. Up, down, down. Up, down, down. Up, down, down. Then I'm going back up, doing an upstroke, two hammer-ons, and back to the up that you started with. So it becomes up, down, down, up, up. So it's actually, after you cycle the lick, it's two ups and two downs. And I don't recommend that you start with this lick. You know, if you want to do that pattern, I would do a simpler one with that same format. For instance, this one that would be A, straight scale down, G, F, E, and a D on the G string. Same exact technique, up, down, down. And an upstroke on the way back up. Up. That way you can really work on the picking part and concentrate on it. You don't have to worry about this giant stretch. Once you master this one, it's gonna be very easy, believe it or not, to do this. Or the diminished version. So we have the E minor 7th version. Here's a diminished version, starting on the same B note. And this is a nice one fingering-wise. It's all three frets apart. And then I'm going to do this crazy major 7th one, if I can remember it, which is... It would be G major 7th. It actually works as a harmony to the E minor 7th. Or... That's a left hand challenge, but a uh, good one. When I first started taking guitar lessons, my teacher just gave me the idea to have one finger per fret. And I sort of took it as a rule, so... The whole step ended up always occurring with my third finger. And um, I never thought of another way to do it. I never saw anybody else do it any other way, so that's all I knew. And I think just from using it, even though the third finger and pinky tend to be weaker fingers, um, through practice and use, they, they got you know, strong enough to do what I wanted. Uh, sometimes even for whole steps, I'll use my, my third finger and fourth. There's, I think there are advantages to both ways. I've, I've seen players, you know, like Ingve Malmsteen uses his second more often, and he does amazing things with it. Um, so, but I, I think there's also some things I can do, especially with um, different scale shapes, like uh, to play a Mixolydian scale. I do this one lick a lot where I just, I just go up and down the, um, the scale notes. And that really lends itself to using these two fingers. Again, I'll, I'll play those on slowly, starting with the low A, or the middle A, I should say. It'd be, uh... Sounds good over an A7 chord. So that's a good exercise for these two. Yeah, this is a good exercise for developing these last two. Um, this would be some in the key of E minor, and it would be a, a stretching a fourth. So you're going from E to A. And the lick itself is going to be starting on the B string, and I'm going to do a B, D, and E. And then I'm going to I'm going to reach up and, and get the G note with my third finger. It's also a good exercise for the third finger having to do that little rocking motion. Now I'm going to alternate, the next time I'm going to go to the A note instead of the G. With my pinky. So I'm getting directly from the E to the A with that one pinky. And I'm going to alternate between the two, which will sound like this. Again, I'm not picking everything, I'm doing, uh, doing like two quick pick notes.
And that's a good sounding lick and it's good for uh, the coordination of the two hands. And also good for, uh, for these fingers, definitely. The, the string skipping stuff, I, I had gone to school and I had learned about uh, arpeggios that you know, existed in music, you know, all kinds of music. And one of them was a, was a minor, seventh, minor seven arpeggio. And I think initially I learned um, you know, sweep picking shapes for it. Or I would learn uh, you know, sort of more traditional. Um, I don't know what you call it, like jazz shapes or something. And so I was familiar with, with the note choice, um, but I, I, I don't know, I don't remember exactly how I did it, but I thought, you know, maybe I could get it, the notes that way, was skipping over a string to get one of those big intervals. And it really worked well with my existing legato techniques. Um, it was, it was already, I already had techniques that I could do with scales, where I would do three notes on a string, three notes on the next string, and one note on the string below. And just, you know, going up and down. So if I took that same three, three, one pattern and applied it to string skipping, and get, I could get some really cool arpeggios. This is, again, that A minor seventh arpeggio. So I'm, I'm getting notes out of A minor seventh, and I'm getting that same pattern, three notes, three notes, and one note. And the, and the techniques required were exactly the same as what I was doing already, so it required zero new practice. Now, it gave me a sound similar to sweep picking in that the intervals were big, but I found that it was much easier uh, because I had a vocabulary of, of uh, legato and hammer-on pull-off licks already for the smaller stuff that I could apply to this. Uh, I could do like a thirds pattern. Or a fours. You know, just little things like that or um, you know, many different variations. And it was really easy to make transitions between my regular licks and this, because this felt like my regular licks. It was based on the same techniques, it was just stretching out a little wider. So um, I like that. I mean, so much of my solo playing has come from learning something very simple and expanding on it. And this is exactly that same principle, just taking you know, something that where I'm not stretching so much and stretching out and suddenly, boom, it's a whole new sound. Well, there's, there's, there's lots of ways. I mean, I was, the first thing I thought of when you said that was actually when I went to school and learned how to harmonize a major scale. And by that, I mean I would take a chord, this is the one they showed us anyway, this is a C major seventh chord, and it's voiced uh, one being the root, the fifth interval, the seventh interval, and the third interval. And uh, we would take each note in, this, in, in that chord and move it up one note in the scale. When you do that, you get this chord, which is a different kind of chord. It's, it's a D, it becomes a D minor seventh, but it still fits into the same key signature. And I'm using a lot of big terms here, and it, 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 you know, I, I do recommend you know, finding a teacher to explain exactly what they are, and it's really easy when you look at, on, look at it on paper. It's a nice mathematical architecture. And as well as looking nice on paper, it sounds good. When you do the whole, all the chords in the entire scale, it'll sound like this. Now, it's not the most heavy metal sounding thing in the world, but it does sound good. And all those chords are in the same key center. So in other words, you could, um, you could play the shape of a C major scale. And depending on what note you finish on, it's, that's, that shape is going to fit over any one of these chords. And I could play the D chord. And I can play the same shape as long as I land on the right chord. Or I could do the same thing with maybe the, the G chord. And 
each time I'm, I'm playing that same shape, but it works with all these chords. So um, when I learned that, you know, I didn't just see it as, oh, here's some new jazz chords and I can learn jazz. I saw it as, now I can take one rock lick and I can move it up all over the neck in the same key. And it really expanded how I looked at soloing. I could take uh, something really simple like uh, an ascending six. You know, it's got six notes, one, two, three, four, five, six, and ascending it goes up. And then I could start on the next step of the scale, change the fingering to be in that, in that scale, to stay within the key signature. Start on the next step, next step, next step, all the way up. And I, I just love that idea. You know, I, I could take one lick and I could multiply it by seven. And that's a big, that's a, that's a lot of extra stuff you get. So it suddenly made the, the whole fretboard available to me, where before if I was in A minor, I'd be stuck here. And suddenly I, I could play all over the place, and that was exciting. Um, I forgot what the question was at the beginning. Creativity. Oh yeah. So that was one way of, very intellectually, creating new ideas for the fretboard. Um, I would say, besides that, one of the best ways to be creative with the instrument is to drop your pick on the floor. I would say besides that, one of the best things is to get rhythmic ideas. Because there's only so many notes on the guitar and it's, it's very easy, especially when you're practicing technique, to forget about the rhythm and to just think, I want to play, you know, I scale up and down as fast as I possibly can and I want to come up with a million sixteenth note patterns and, uh, you know, I want to pick them very fast. And so much of the beauty and coolness of music is involved in the rhythms and the spaces in between. And to me, a great way to come up with that is to choose a rhythm or a tempo, and you can just scratch it out on the guitar and start improvising along with it. And you can do it with another guitar player and, and trade off, which is really fun, or you can just do it by yourself. And what you, what you begin to find is, is very simple things will be very powerful. Um, when you don't have a rhythm, simple things aren't that interesting. It's how they relate to the rhythm that makes them cool. So you gotta have the rhythm as your, as your base. And you start adding things in. That's just, I mean, I start having fun with it, you know, you gotta, I'll be here for an hour doing that. But to me, that's really enjoyable and all kinds of ideas come out of it. Um, other creative things. Lyrics are really good for coming up with, uh, I mean, at the end, you can, you can just use the lyric as a rhythmic and melodic tool and you can toss it away at the end if you want, if you want to write an instrumental. So, for, for example, you could, you could take any lyric or phrase and turn it into music. Um, just off the top of my head, you could take, uh, I read guitar techniques every month. You know, it'd be like, um, let's see, I read guitar techniques, uh, how to phrase it? I read guitar techniques every month. You know, there's a rhythm. So let's add some notes to it now. You know, I read guitar every month. <laughs> so it's, it's a way to, it's a way to get, to just get started. You know, at the end of the song, you, you might have gotten rid of the lyric, but at least it gave you a riff. Um, there's a, a, an American TV show called Entertainment Tonight, and the theme is da, 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 da. and every time I hear it, I think Entertainment Tonight. You know, I bet the writer did that. <laughs> so that's a, a great way to, to create new stuff. Well, the box stuff is a great technical challenge to figure out because originally it wasn't played on guitar; it was usually played on piano or harpsichord or maybe cello or violin. So. Um, in order to get those notes on the guitar, to me, is a really fun and interesting challenge and inspires new techniques that I might not have thought of otherwise. Um, 
it does inspire stuff that I'll that I'll do in my in my rock band. Um, I would say, you know, mostly. I mean, not so much in, in the blues sense, but actually, it, it could there too, you know, because the, the, some of the rhythmic things. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I'm trying to remember the, the song. You know, just that the, the, right there. There's, there's a, you know, some rhythms I wouldn't have thought of before. You, know, you could go like. You know, it's that same same rhythm, but but rock notes. Um, let's see. Oh, and also like. Um, For that, you know, you could do. I mean, of course, a lot of you know, Ingve Malmsteen style stuff is classically based. But I could take, I could take that those patterns I learned in that piece, and maybe uh, do something like uh, what was that one? And come up with my own simpler version of it. Um, I wish that I was as compositionally advanced as Bach was, because the things he wrote were, I can figure them out. But when I see them there, I don't really know how he came up with them. Um, to me, they're, they're, they, they all sound beautiful. He's not dissonant. It's not weird. It's, it's, that complexity isn't too much for my ear, but it's beyond the math that I know. And I, I would love to learn that math someday, math being the music theory that's behind that. Because um, I'm, I'm sure it would be applicable to, to, to rock or, or to a lot of things. Uh, some of it is, a lot of it has to do with live performance. Uh, to be able to do something that I can do, you know, sitting down here in a controlled environment, on stage when the monitors are terrible and the, and you know your the, the stage is uneven and you're you know there's just a million things going against you and to still be able to do it well, um, and also to be able to really communicate emotionally to the audience through the instrument, um, and that's. That to me, although it seems like a simple thing, took such a long time and, con and continues to be an art. Uh, because when you, when you write your songs and you, you know, compose your solos and you practice, usually you're either practicing by yourself or you're communicating with the other musicians. And suddenly you're put in this different situation where you have to communicate outward. And it's, it's completely different. Um, the thing that I would originally do, like when, it was, when I was with Mr. Big, is we would have a set prepared. We'd do it the same way every night. It would be really tight, really well played, but depending on how the audience was, we wouldn't change it. You know, no matter who the audience was or, or how they felt or what the venue was, we would play that set the same way. And uh, sometimes it was great, and sometimes it was a little out of sync. And I really enjoy now Taking a little more chance, taking more chances, and modifying what I do to fit how I f what I feel coming out of the audience. Um, when I do shows now, sometimes I'll come out just with my guitar. I'll look at the audience, and I'll really look at them, you know, sort of check people out see, and, and get a feel for it. And I'll just play a chord softly, and then think, you know, what's, you know, I mean, it all sounds very new age and trippy, but but um, the result of it has been some of the most amazing playing I've done. You know, things have come out of me that never would have come out otherwise. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a place to start, but once you've built all these techniques, they're, they're just tools to, you know, to, 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 to communicate your emotions and your, and your art. And uh, you have to communicate them to someone. And sometimes it's helpful to, uh, to be aware of that someone. <laughs> so, um, more specifically on the guitar, I still feel that, that, that vibrato and phrasing and, and all the really simple things, or seemingly simple things, because they're not fast, um, have a great, great power. You know, if I just bend a, a string in time, that, that somehow emotes, you know, it has, emotes a lot of power. And the more techniques I come up with bending, I mean, I'm really excited when I come up with a new bending technique. If I can go, like, this is a newer one going. You know, it just has a, a soul to it, you know, that you can't get on piano. I mean, most of the, so many things, the way I think about guitar is piano-ish. You know, I like, the, I like the, the math of piano. It's very appealing to my intellect. But emotionally, if I can go... 
you know, or, or just get some screaming notes out of the guitar. You know, you know that's that to me is gives me the, probably the greatest joy, and I and I still, uh, you know, have a really good time pursuing that. Um, I mean, very recently I, I learned a lick where I bend up. And I love that. I could play the thing forever because it's like a new way of bending up and then down. I got to switch over the little string. You know, I use that all over the place, and I can't wait to find find the next one. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's um, just you know, now that I've got all these tools, I want to find the best way to use them to uh, you know to speak the people to speak to the people who love music like I do. <laughs>